Today, what are the four great discoveries of modern science that prove God exists? The first great discovery of modern science is that the universe had a beginning. Where did it come from? Historian of science, Fred Burnham has written, the God hypothesis is now a more persuasive and respectable hypothesis than at any time in the last 100 years. The second great scientific discovery was that space and time also had a beginning. This discovery demands an explanation. It calls for a transcendent cause beyond the universe itself. The third great discovery of modern science is that the laws and constants of the universe have been fine-tuned for human life to exist. As physicist Fred Hoyle has written, a common sense interpretation of the evidence suggests a super intellect has monkeyed with physics and chemistry as well as biology to make life possible. The fourth great discovery of modern science is the digital code embedded in the DNA molecule in every human cell. The three billion characters of precise information in the digital code instruct the cell how to build complex molecules to do the work so the cell can stay alive. Where did this specified information come from? It is compelling evidence of an intelligent designer for the origin of human life. My guest today, who will explain these four great scientific discoveries, is Dr. Stephen Meyer, who received his PhD in the philosophy of science from Cambridge University. He is co-founder of the intelligent design movement in the world and a senior fellow at the Discovery Institute. We invite you to join us for this special edition of The John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program. We're going to talk today about the question, do you believe that the scientific evidence from biology and cosmology actually points to an intelligent cause of the universe and of life itself? And if you've been with us for the last series of programs, we first of all took biology and then we went into cosmology. And today Steve is going to summarize both of those and put them together and then talk about which worldview in the end it's pointing to. So Stephen, start us off. Well, you bet. The, uh, we've, we've looked at evidence of design in, in biology. We've seen that there's evidence of design in physics built into the very fabric of the universe. We've looked at evidence for a definite beginning to the universe. And I've, I've been fascinated with this for years. I first encountered this kind of uh, new perspective on science in a conference in 1985. And, uh, and so I've been thinking for years about which worldview makes best sense of the experience that we have of nature, of these big discoveries about the origin of the universe, the fine-tuning of the universe, the origin of life, and, and other evidences of, of design that I will want to talk about today. And so maybe a good place to start is just to by talking about the competing worldviews. If you treat a, a, a worldview, first of all, is a, a, um, a coherent a set of answers to some basic questions, questions about, for example, ultimate reality. What's the thing from which everything else came? What's the entity from which everything else came? And as you look at the evidence from nature, there are a number of different worldviews that you might posit to try to explain what we see in the, in the natural world. And, one, and uh, we can summarize those briefly. Uh, materialism is the idea that matter and energy are the entity from which everything else comes. And you can kind of represent that graphically if you look at, uh, if you represent the universe as a big circle, as I've done here with these, these uh, kind of cartoons. And the, the, the pendulum there represents the laws of nature, the, the, the people and the planets and the, uh, the trees and the mountains. That represents all the physical stuff in the universe. And the key tenet of the materialistic worldview is there's nothing beyond the physical world that exists. There's no God. There's no purpose or entity that could provide a purpose for the universe. The fundamental entity from which everything else comes is matter and energy. Now, there's a, another the, a contrary worldview that is kind of on the other end of the spectrum, and that's theism. Theism holds that there is an orderly concourse of nature, thus there are laws of nature, again represented by the pendulum going back and forth, and, but that the universe is not autonomous and self-existent. That beyond the universe there's a God, and that God acted to bring the universe into existence. That's the middle arrow in the 
in the little diagram, that God underwrites the order of nature, that God sustains the universe in, in its orderly concourse, and in fact what we call the laws of nature are nothing more than a mode of God's action, a mode of divine action. And thirdly, there's an arrow that suggests that, that God periodically enters into the creation that he otherwise uh, ordinarily sustains and upholds. So God acts as an agent within the created order from time to time as well. That's the theistic worldview. Now there are two other worldviews that have been very dominant in the thinking of, of our civilization from, uh, from time to time. One is the deistic worldview that holds that there is a God that's separate from the universe, but that that God is, never acts within the cosmos. Uh, that uh, this was the clockwork maker idea of the 18th century, that God, in a sense, wound up the universe, designed it at the beginning, but then let it on its own and never had anything more to do with, with God. It was all a setup job from the beginning and, and nothing was done beyond that. And then there's the great Eastern worldview called pantheism. And that worldview says that there is a God, but God is impersonal. God does not... Uh, is not a mind or a personal agent, is not conscious, it's not someone to whom you can communicate through prayer or any other means. And instead, God is the, the mystical unity that binds all things together. All matter is in God, all God is in matter, um, and, and that's the, the, the pantheistic perspective. So we've got these four great systems of thought. And what I've been curious about for years is which one best explains the evidence that we have in the natural world. You can treat a worldview also as a kind of metaphysical hypothesis, an explanatory system. So which one accounts best for these amazing discoveries that have been revealed by 20th century science? And so let's just quickly review those discoveries, the very things we've been talking about in the preceding programs. One is the discovery that the universe has a definite beginning. This was first discovered as a result of Hubble's observation that the universe is expanding in all directions. The galaxies are expanding, and if you wind the time clock backwards, you ultimately get to a beginning of the expansion and the beginning of the universe. That was something that, that Einstein came to realize, mm -hmm. somewhat reluctantly, as we discussed. Uh, another great discovery is the, the realization that not only is there a beginning to time, but there's a beginning to space itself. That as you go back far enough in time, the curvature of space becomes infinitely tight, corresponding to zero spatial volume, and thus you have a true singularity at the beginning in the, in the words of the astronomers. And that also cries out for explanation. It seems to point to the need for some kind of cause beyond the universe itself, for the universe as a whole. Mm -hmm. because. You can't put much matter in zero spatial volume, in fact, none at all. So a materialistic explanation would seem to be kind of off the, off the table. So uh, that's one of the great discoveries. The other thing that we talked about is the, the fine-tuning of the, of the laws and constants of physics and the fine-tuning of the configuration of matter at the very beginning of the universe. And what physicists have realized since the 1960s is that the universe is finely tuned to allow for the possibility of life, such that one famous physicist, Fred Hoyle, said, uh, that a common sense interpretation of physics, uh, of the data, suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics and chemistry and biology to make life possible, that um, the universe looks like a setup job. So uh, in, in, uh, th that's a second huge discovery. So as I looked at the competing worldviews and asked which one of the four great worldviews could account for this evidence, I, I realized eh, kind of a, through a process of deliberation that both materialism, scientific materialism, and pantheism have a hard time accounting for both of these two classes of evidence because they don't posit the existence of anything beyond the universe and still less anything intelligent beyond the universe. And yet the fine tuning cries out for intelligence and the, 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 the cosmological singularity cries out for a cause beyond the universe, a transcendent cause. So when you take those two pieces of evidence together, it looks to me like only theism and deism provide an adequate explanation because they posit an entity beyond the universe itself which can act to bring the universe into existence. Stephen, in adjudicating between theism and deism, what other evidence do you have? Let's go back to biology and summarize that for a moment too. Well, that's, that's really where the key evidence lies because we realize that the origin of life took place some time after the origin of the universe. We're talking about uh, evidence, if we have see evidence of design in biology, that evidence, w that would point to not a deistic creator, 
which confined its activity to the very beginning of the universe and then had nothing to do with the universe ever thereafter, that would imply some kind of agent that is acting after the universe has come into existence, either a, a theistic designer or some kind of uh, imminent designer, a space alien or something. Mm -hmm. we, I think we've already provided evidence that, it, that we... Can't uh, be a space alien. It can't be a space alien because we've got evidence built into the fabric of the universe of design. That can't be explained. So if you want a hypothesis that explains all the classes of evidence, I think you need to invoke a theistic design hypothesis, but you can't see that until you realize that there's strong evidence of design in biology as well as physics and cosmology. And what is it? Well, that's what we talked about in the first a uh, series of programs that right. you brought me to here uh, earlier, and, uh, and, and that's the evidence of design that you find because of the, the information that's embedded in the DNA molecule. Uh, Francis Crick, 1957, he proposes what's called the sequence hypothesis. He proposes that along the spine of the DNA molecule, the four chemicals that are present there, the so-called bases, are functioning just like alphabetic characters in a written language or digital characters in the machine code. His hypothesis is eventually confirmed. Biologists today now realize that it's information that's running the show inside life. The digital code in the DNA molecule is essential to living functions. And to get life going in the first place, you've got to account for the origin of that information. Now, in my book, Signature in the Cell, um, I discuss this at great length. What I tried to do in the book was to show that there's a positive case for intelligent design based on this critical discovery. And I actually developed this case using the method of reasoning that Darwin himself used in his book, The Origin of Species. It's a scientific method for investigating events in the remote past. If you want to find out what caused something to happen a long time ago, you need to identify a cause which is capable of producing the event you're trying to explain. Mm -hmm. And the key thing we're trying to explain in The Origin of Life is the origin of the information that's necessary to make life possible. And Darwin's principle, which he got from his, uh, his mentor, Charles Lyell, was simply that you've got to find a cause which is capable of producing what you're trying to explain. Lyell put it this way. He said we should be looking for a cause that's now in operation. And when I saw that phrase in Lyell's, uh, on, on the front piece of his book, I realized, wow, it's, going to be, it's possible to make a scientific case for intelligent design. Because what we know from experience, which is the basis of all scientific reasoning, is that information always arises from intelligence. In fact, one information scientist put it this way. He said, the creation of new information is habitually associated with conscious activity. Well, now, step back for just a minute. What do we have in the history of life but an infusion of new information that is necessary to get life going? And that most scientists date that occurrence in the origin of the first life at about 3.85 billion years ago. Well, that's 10 billion years after the Big Bang. So if it's not a space alien who is the designer, um, it's clearly not a deistic creator either, because a deistic creator confines its activity to the beginning of the universe and, and no other time. So what we're looking at is evidence of design, which when coupled with the evidence that we've seen from physics of design that's built into the very fabric of the universe, is pointing in a decidedly theistic direction towards a designer who not only acted at the beginning of the universe, but who is also capable of acting after t equals zero, after the beginning of the universe, and within the history of the cosmos. Because that's what we see in biology, is evidence of design that arose in the history of the cosmos well after the beginning. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about more evidence. We've talked about chemical evolution. Actually, how did how that first cell start? OK, you just nailed that one down. But you also have a whole series of bits of information about biological evolution, and we want the folks to see that, and we're going to talk about that next, so stick with us. If you would like to have all of the information in our series, the four great discoveries of modern science that prove God exists with Dr. Stephen Meyer, it's available on DVD for a gift of $49, and you may order this series now by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. All right, we're back. We're talking with Stephen Meyer, philosopher of science, and we're talking now about biological evolution, all right? Uh, we've shown that chemical evolution can't occur by chance, all right? 
But what about the development later? It seems like there's a problem over there too, and you've got a great illustration, and it goes back to helping us decide, adjudicate between theism and deism. What is that? Well, right, I think the, the crucial question is, again, design. And where do we find design in the universe? And I've got a little timeline on the screen that I think helps. Uh, you think of a locus or a loci of design, places where design is evident. And if design is only evident at the origin of the universe, then you could invoke a deistic kind of conception of the designer, a deistic God, as an adequate metaphysical hypothesis. If the evidence, if design is only evident in, in life, but not in the universe, then you might invoke a space alien or something. But um, if you've got evidence in both places, I think you really need a theistic, a concept of a theistic designer to account for the evidence. A designer is capable of, of building design into the very fabric of the universe and then acting after the universe has been uh, created to, to, to implement other design, to, to bring that into existence. And that's what we see in the case of the origin of the first life. I think there's compelling evidence of design there at the point of the origin of the first cell. And that's what my book, Signature in the Cell, is about. Mm -hmm. But I actually think that there's evidence of design further down along the timeline. In addition to the evidence for design at the beginning of the first life, at the point of the origin of the first cell, I think there's compelling evidence of design in the origin of the major animal body plans, so an event that's known to paleontologists as the Cambrian explosion. This, date is, this, this event is dated about 530 million years ago, well after, again, the beginning of the universe. So we've got evidence of design arising uh, sometime af well after the beginning of the universe. Um, and, and let's have a look at what, what biologists are, are discovering there. This event is called the Cambrian Explosion, and basically what happens is that in a very narrow window of geologic time, uh, between about three and six million years, the, the major new uh, anatomical novelties arise in the history of, of, of life. There's a, a group of about 19 to th maybe 30, depending on how you count, new body plants, new body architectures that come. They're the first animals, and they come into the F Cambrian fossil record all around the world at roughly the same time in this very narrow window of time. And th this presents a tremendous problem if you're trying to explain this from a Darwinian point of view for a number of reasons. First of all, it doesn't match the Darwinian picture of the history of life. Darwin's idea was that there was a beautiful tree that described the history of life, that one form of life morphed gradually into another one. But when we're talking about these first animal forms, they arise suddenly without any ancestral precursors that, that uh, in a sense, announce their coming. There's no gradual morphing evident in the fossil record at all. You've got so a blast of new information. You have a blast of new form which requires information. So that, again, is the big question. Where that information come from, if mutation and selection can't account for it, and I'm convinced, and many other scientists are convinced that it can't, well, what, a, what, what other explanation is, is on offer? Well, again, I think this is where intelligent design has something to offer, because we know from experience that large infusions of information are the product of mind. We know of a cause which is capable of producing the effect which is on display in this Cambrian event, this Cambrian explosion. Mm -hmm. So I think it's another evidence of intelligence because you've got new form which requires new information, you've got a lot of it coming into the fossil record very suddenly, I think that's pointing to intelligence. And Stephen, isn't it true that that's the case all the way up the line? Well, there are many other examples of large um, innovations and in new biological form arising in the history of life. Uh, and every time you have a new innovation in form, you need uh, new arrangements of cell types. You need new cell types, new dedicated proteins, and therefore a lot, at least a lot of new information in DNA and maybe even information that's expressed in, at, a, at higher levels in the biological hierarchy. So new form requires new information. And we have many events where you have a sudden emergence of new form. For example, the mammalian radiation. You get between 13 and 15 new orders of mammals uh, about 50 to 55 million years ago. You have the origin of flowering plants, what's called the big, the, the big bloom in the, in the, in the Cretaceous. Uh, you have uh, other uh, the origins of different groups of insects come very suddenly into the fossil record. Uh, and uh, the origin of marine reptiles, many other groups come into the fossil record very suddenly. In each case, they require a lot of new form, a lot of new structure, and therefore a lot of new information. And I, I'm increasingly convinced that the Darwinian mechanism of mutation and selection does not account for that. 
And instead, we're seeing a feature that we know intelligent design does readily account for. And therefore, I think we're seeing evidence of intelligent design at multiple instances along the, the, the cosmic timeline. Stephen, is there any other evidence from biology that shows design? Well, there's another whole class of evidence, and it's the, dig or it's the nanotechnology that we're finding inside cells. Uh, my colleague Michael Behe has made some of this famous in his book, Darwin's Black Box, but there are many examples of these exquisite molecular machines inside living organisms. For example, this is a, what's called an ATP synthase. It's the, the, uh, the, the machine that makes the battery packs that provide the energy that keep all of our cells alive. We have these in the membrane of our mitochondrial cells. And uh, there's a ro you know, beautiful rotor and which creates a torque on a shaft, which creates a conformational change in proteins, which opens up a beautiful pocket into which two molecules fit exactly right. The pocket closes, they, they combine, and then they're released. And there you've got an energy source for the, for the cell. There's machinery like this, rotary engines, sliding clamps, little robotic walking proteins. The cell is chock full of digital or of, of nanotechnology that is that gives every appearance of having been designed. And I, I personally don't think that this has been explained well by mutation and selection either. Where does this leave us in terms of worldviews? If, if you realize that we're seeing evidence of design at several places along the cosmological timeline in, in the living world, the origin of the first life, the origin of the Cambrian animals, the origin of other major groups of animals, the origin of these miniature machines, what you're seeing then is evidence of design that's not just confined to the very beginning of the universe with the fine-tuning uh, fine laws and constants of physics, but you're seeing design that is infused in the cosmos at episodic intervals throughout the history of the cosmos. And therefore, we're not seeing evidence of design that can be explained by a deistic creator. We're not seeing evidence that can be explained by any uh, worldview that denies there is an intelligent cause. Instead, we're looking at evidence that, can, that requires a, design, a designer who acts at the beginning of the universe and that who also acts after the beginning of the universe. And that sounds to me a lot like a theistic designer, a, a designer who has the attributes that uh, religious believers have typically uh, associated with, with God. Transcendent, intelligent, and active in history. And I, I think for, that's one of the reasons that you're seeing many, many people moving away from the so-called new atheism, which I think is really the old atheism. For example, Anthony Flew, who, who uh, was a longtime atheist, who came to realize that there was compelling evidence of a creator in the, the physical world, both in cosmology and biology. The historian Fred Burnham has said that the God hypothesis is now a more persuasive uh, and respectable hypothesis than at any time in the last hundred years. I agree, I think it's not only more respectable, I think it's the best explanation of, the, the, of this ensemble of critical evidence from cosmology, physics, and biology that uh, we've been able to discuss on your program. Stephen, I want to say thank you to you for coming. All the folks that are watching, I'm sure, realize you're just a brilliant, brilliant man that God is using, and we appreciate you coming and delivering all this information to us. It's been a privilege to have you here. It's been a privilege to be here and to have this great conversation and the chance to talk to all the people that you reach through your terrific program. And folks, I'm glad that you did join us today, and I hope that you'll join me again next week. If you would like to have all of the information in our new series, The Four Great Discoveries of Modern Science That Prove God Exists with Dr. Stephen Meyer, it's available on DVD for a gift of $49. You will learn how scientists have discovered that the universe had a definite beginning, a discovery that verifies the biblical statement, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth how space and time also had a beginning, a discovery that demands a transcendent cause beyond the physical universe itself, a cause which Christians call God, how the universe has been fine-tuned for human life to exist, and how design has been built into the very fabric of the laws and constants of physics, and how the digital code in the DNA molecule of every human cell is compelling evidence of an intelligent designer for the origin of human life. All four television programs in this important series are available on DVD for a gift of $49. Then second, our series, Does the New Scientific Evidence About the Origin of Life Put an End to Darwinian Evolution? Also with Dr. Stephen Meyer. 
In this series, you will learn how the human cell is complex beyond belief, a veritable micro-miniaturized factory containing thousands of exquisitely designed pieces of molecular machinery, how the three billion characters of precise digital code embedded in the DNA molecule is compelling evidence of an intelligent designer for the origin of human life. All five television programs in this series are available on DVD for a gift of $49. And third, we have written two new study guides with extensive notes that parallels each of our television series with Dr. Meyer. They are available for a gift of $8 each or for five or more copies for $5 each. Fourth, we are making available three beautiful documentary films. First, Unlocking the Mystery of Life, which will transport you by state-of-the-art computer animation into the interior of the trillions of cells in our bodies to show you the systems and machines that are present and bear the unmistakable hallmarks of God's design. Second, the hour-long film documentary the Privileged Planet, which will show you how the laws of physics are precisely fine-tuned for the existence of life, why Earth's environment provides a delicate and exceedingly rare cradle for complex life and points to a universe that is designed by God. Third, the documentary film Darwin's Dilemma, which explores the Cambrian explosion of plants and animals. Where are the missing transitional fossils and links that Darwin postulated should be in the fossil record? Can any naturalistic evolutionary process explain this startling explosion of early plant and animal life? Or does the Cambrian fossil record point unmistakably to purpose and intelligent design? The three documentary movies are available for a gift of $45. And finally, if you would like to have all of the materials mentioned today, including the two television series, plus the two study guides, plus the three documentary movies, all of these materials together are available in a special package for only $129. And you may order this special package now by calling us at 1-800-805 that's 1-800-805-3030. Or you may order these programs at our website at jashow.org.